Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cold War Spaces. Thanks for tuning in today. I'd like to welcome our guest, Rose Dosti, um, who will be speaking about internment space, political prisoners in, the Cold, in Cold War Albania. She's the founder and president of the Albanian Human Rights Project. Founded in 2008, the Albanian Human Rights Project is a nonprofit volunteer organization dedicated to preserving 100 testimonies of former Albanian political prisoners who were imprisoned and turned or banished during the Cold War. <clears throat> and the project um, preserves those historical documents for scholarly study and inspiration. And the AHRP gifted the testimonies to the Venda Museum collection for further preservation, scholarly study, education, and inspiration for generations to come. Rose Dossi is also a former Los Angeles Times staff writer and columnist and an author of eight books on food. She was a Fulbright scholar and has taught journalism at the University of Tirana, UCLA, and Santa Monica College. Today's program will be about a 30-minute conversation between Rose and Yus Siegel, the Venda's chief curator and director of programming. And we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, so please get your questions ready, put in the Q&A box during that time. Um, and as always, we appreciate everyone's questions, but please keep them short and no longer than a sentence or two so that we can try to get to everyone's. And for any other comments or discussion, please use the chat box. Um, it's always nice to see uh, what city you're tuning in from, if you want to say hi there. And a quick reminder to, cho uh, to, to change the blue box there to panelists and attendees, not just panelists, so that everyone in the audience can see your messages. We'll be posting the recording of this program on our Vimeo page and also in podcast format on our SoundCloud page afterwards. And lastly, I'd like to thank Susan Horowitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting discussion series at the Venda and our virtual programs. And now I'll hand it off to you to get started. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna Rose. And uh, Rose, uh, so wonderful to have you here. Welcome to Cold War Spaces. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure, and I see you are already being welcomed in the chat by various people. <laughs> so I would like to start uh, with a personal question. Uh, your parents, you were born yourself in the United States, but your parents uh, came from Albania and immigrated to the United States. Yes. When my... was that, and uh, why did they decide to make that move? Yes, my father was 14, actually, when he left his native uh, a, a mountain village uh, high in the uh, southern Alps of Albania and uh, traveled to Argentina first, then to, to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where there were some Albanians, and then to New York, where he became a chef, a, a cook, uh, and uh, worked very hard. He supported his family. He bought them a, a house and a, and a grocery business. And uh, at age uh, 30, in 1928, he decides that he would like to start a family and would like to have an Albanian wife. So he uh, asked for the hand in marriage of my mother, who originally had been um, a village girl in the uh, uh, high uh, Alps in uh, southern, Euro uh, southern Albania. Uh, <laughs> but the family fled because of uh, a Greek war and ended up in the city of Lora, where she was adopted by a wonderful, uh, um, doc a wonderful doctor, his family of uh, two children, a wife had died, and led a magnificent life of uh, opera season uh, in Italy, uh, a cook in the kitchen, uh, tea in the afternoon. Uh, well, when she heard that my, that my father had been in America and was an American uh, citizen, she just uh, accepted the offer. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought her down of all places. She thought he was uh, not wealthy, but certainly well off uh, enough to have properties. Uh, little did she know he would, uh, she would end up in the Lower East Side of Manhattan right. uh, in the midst of uh, working class Albanian uh, immigrants, the first wave of Albanian immigrants uh, in New York. And however, they were all patriotic Albanians, but very proud American citizens. When my mother became a citizen, she, she celebrated. She was uh, deliriously happy. Um, they, um, uh, the Great Depression uh, set in. Um, my sister and I were born and, uh, uh, 
and my father uh, a little later on uh, became uh, a known operator of of uh, uh, restaurants uh, mm. but by 19 and they communicated regularly with albania uh, my mother sent i remember my mother sending packages constantly to her uh, both adopted family and her her biological family but uh, by 1945, when the Iron Curtain fell, communication more or less ceased. Uh, there was a cursory, hello, how are you, but nothing more. Uh, she yeah, you mean when the Second World War ended in 1945? Yes, yeah, yes, right. yes, yeah. yes, uh, yes. Um, uh, she later learned, much later learned, after, after the Berlin Wall uh, fell, uh, that her her, uh, her adopted family's home had been confiscated, and the family was relegated to living in a basement apartment, uh, basement storage area. Uh, right. And uh, the brother, the adopted brother's teeth had been yanked out because he was he had been communicating with the West, a family in the West. And that was his punishment. Yeah. That was his punishment, yes. And now we will get back to that uh, part of history um, uh, before mm -hmm. long. I wanted to ask you a little bit later, well, actually in 1944, your late husband, uh, Luan Dosti, moved from Albania to um, the United States. And what motivated him to leave his country? Well, it was uh, the... Uh, he was he was a very clever uh, fellow. He was bright. He was psychologically astute, and he suffered no fools. And he was one of eight children of uh, uh, Hassan Dosti, a former chief justice of the Supreme Court and co-founder of Albania's first Democratic Party, to accompany him and his followers to the mountains to fight the Nazis. But when it was clear that uh, the uh, uh, communists were gaining control of the country. His father decided to go uh, to travel to Italy, which was then a free zone, to plead with the allies to, uh, uh, to keep Albania within the Western sphere of influence rather than allowing, them, allowing it to go uh, with the uh, Soviets. Uh, but uh, that didn't work. By 1955, uh, uh, Albania was part of the Warsaw Pact countries. So uh, he still, Mr. Dosti had hopes of returning, but it was very clear that when the, the communists did take over, they were declared enemies of the people and could he and his followers could not return to Albania. There was a price on their head that prevented it. Meanwhile, uh, they learned uh, that they, uh, the mother, uh, Mr. Dossi's wife, had been murdered by the Nazi soldiers on a loot and burn mission on their way to Germany after the war. Uh, and that all seven siblings were rounded up, they're aged five to 17, were rounded up and imprisoned or sent to labor camps for the next 47 years. Uh, Luan by then uh, was sponsored uh, in 1949 to come to the United States uh, to, uh, to live with an, to, uh, sponsored by an aunt actually in New York. Uh, 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 this was at, 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 while staying at a displaced persons camp, that was where he was sponsored. Uh, an elite group uh, of working. These, this was an elite. I mean, Luan and his and his friends were an elite group of Albanians uh, with a fine education. They were uh, they were active uh, politically, and uh, they came in the midst of a working class uh, uh, New York City. Mm -hmm. And but uh, uh, on occasion the. The uh, Albanians in New York were rather hostile to this new group because they were patriotic. They thought they were doing the right thing, but actually they learned to adjust and uh, uh, accept these these newcomers uh, with open arms in ma many cases. Uh, uh, two years later, Mr. Dosti was um, 
invited to, to chair the National Committee for a Free Albania, which was a subsidiary of uh, the US State Department initiative to uh, influence, uh, uh, to, uh, to fight communism in Europe. Uh, Luan continued to um, work uh, and uh, he became a secretary in the Committee for Free Albania. He won a scholarship to Colombia. We married, that's when we were married. Uh, he was drafted, shortly after we were married, he was drafted in the Air Force and spent three and a half years teaching teaching mathematics at the uh, Samson Air Force Base. Uh, he returned to Columbia uh, to um, work on a master's degree. And I worked as a receptionist at the Columbia School of Journalism. We started a family, but uh, when uh, my uh, youngest daughter, uh, younger daughter was three weeks old, a fire forced um, forced uh, uh, Luan to uh, my husband to drop his master's program and uh, seek work as an en uh, aerospace engineer. Uh, a third child was born and Luan, by 1991, he had uh, been working as an aerospace engineer. I called him my Cold War warrior. Uh, he uh, he uh, became a uh, marketing director for uh, in the Middle East for an aerospace company while I worked at the LA Times as a staff writer. Um, at that time, we weren't sure if we would ever see his siblings again in our lifetime. Right, and let me, if I may interrupt you here, because as you mentioned, uh, um, he didn't see his siblings and you never met his siblings for this I period of 47 did, no. years. But then after the end of one party rule in Albania in 1991, there was the first opportunity for the two of you to travel to Albania. Yes. So my question would be, how did you actually track <laughs> um, his family yes. and how, in what condition, what circumstances yes. did you yes. find them? Well, it all it all started with a phone call from Albania in mm. 1991, and it happened to be from someone who said he was Vic, Victor and wanted to speak with his father. Well, it was a shock to hear the voice of one of the oldest brother. Uh, asking to speak with his father, who I thought, you know, would absolutely uh, perish if he, if, if I woke him up at that wee hour of the morning and then, and told him that his son was calling on the phone. And uh, he talked to, uh, he, I, I did arrange to have him talk to him uh, the next day to prepare him. And uh, he hung up, he talked briefly, hung up the phone, and I said, aren't you deliriously happy with uh, speaking with your son on finding your son? He said, how do I know he's really my son? You know how the wow. communists were. Oh, right. Well, right. it was it was his son. And when I uh, called my husband, who was traveling uh, at that time and told him about uh, Victor's call, he was he was beyond elated. He said, we have to go back. Luckily. Right. Luckily, uh, Ramiz Ali, by this time, Enver Hoja had died and Ramiz Ali, the succeeder, successor, uh, was, allow, was allowing travel to Albania of anyone. So uh, we uh, uh, got on a flight, a mm -hmm. circuitous flight to Albania because there was no flights to Albania at that time. And uh, actually uh, found our family living in a, in uh, central Albania swamp field in a mud hut with uh, four walls and no roof and dirt floor. Uh, the reunion was ec ecstatic, uh, extraordinary, hugging, kissing, weeping. I couldn't stop my tears from flowing. Yeah. Uh, it was, so was, of, was that a, a labor camp where you found them? In the labor, labor camp, it was a yeah. labor camp. They right. had all reunited in the labor camp after many years. They had been separated um, for numerous years and then finally uh, reunited uh, in this one uh, labor camp in uh, central, Alba central Albania. Uh, 
Luan promised to uh, have them relocated in Tirana, which he mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, when uh, shortly after that, Mr. Darcy died, never having laid eyes on his children again. The, uh, Luan brought, uh, encouraged the, his brothers to reclaim their, their place in society, and they actually did. Tomar became a, a deputy in the parliament at that time. Skunder, the middle uh, brother, uh, joined a prison rights uh, group. And Victor, the oldest one who had called us, uh, became a member of the Helsinki Committee, which was an international uh, European uh, committee to uh, uh, help uh, uh, human rights issues. Uh, Luan um, uh, rolled up his sleeves at that time as an aerospace engineer with lots of connections and um, uh, brought world-class investors to Albania to help resuscitate the failed economy. And uh, unfortunately, he couldn't finish his work because he too died in 1992. Right, right. So um, uh, you are the founder and president of the Albanian Human Rights uh, Projects, about which we will uh, talk in a minute. But um, uh, you spoke with so many uh, former Albanian uh, political prisoners. Can you give us an impression um, what motivated the government to take these prisoners? What did yes. you have to do in order to be sent <laughs> to the prison or a labor camp? Yes. And can you also describe a little bit the conditions in those labor yes, camps? Yes, it was, uh, yes. The, um, uh, one of the prisoners uh, um, described Hoja as more Stalinist than Stalin, with an ideology of centralization and tyranny uh, for anyone who opposed the government, whether real or perceived, uh, we soon learned that 50,000 Albanians were registered pris imprisoned, uh, imprisoned and, uh, and tortured, and 5,000 had been shot or hanged. We later, of course, much later, that number doubled. 20% of the population had been imprisoned, and 6,000 people had been uh, killed. There were 23 jails, 48 labor camps throughout Albania, and persecution started by targeting the uh, landowners because land could be confiscated, property could be confiscated to be used for whatever purposes the Communist Party had in mind. Uh, there, uh, they targeted uh, they targeted artists, writers. In fact, one of the artists was featured in your little program. Nice. And, uh, and Max Bellow, who was who was who was arrested and interned for oh no imprisoned uh, for having been overheard to uh, admire the works of Chagall and Picasso, who were Western artists, and uh, that was think, enough to put him in prison for that a long was time. enough to yes and yeah. and and uh, uh, they even they even targeted their own kind when when they fell in disfavor. Uh, for any reason at all, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, former former party members. She was a she was the sec uh, sec uh, secretary of the Central Committee and a Politburo um, a member. And because her husband, uh, a former Minister of Agriculture, made some comment against the use of agriculture by the by the uh, Yugoslavs. He, uh, she was in prison for 35 years, 30, 35 years. Uh, students, business owners, clan chiefs. One of, one of the uh, prisoners was a woman whose father was a tribal chieftain up, up north. And he had fought the fascists. The fascists rounded him up and his family and, and sent them to Italy to serve time in a prison camp. When they, uh, when they, when Italy lost the war, <laughs> uh, they uh, returned to Albania only to be imprisoned for the next 47 years by the communist regime. Clerics were targeted. Clerics were, uh, uh, well, they, they faced a lot of uh, persecution because uh, by 1967, during the Chinese counter uh, counter revolution, 
all religions were banned. In one case, this uh, Dom Gergi Simoni uh, was an aspiring priest. He was a seminary student and uh, he was arrested because he had written some so-called decadent uh, uh, religious poetry. And he spent 35 years in prison. When the Berlin Wall fell and Mother Teresa visited Albania, he by then had been released and had gone to school to become a priest. She ordained him bishop of the cathedral in Skodr. Uh, extended families were targeted. I mean, they, who, innocent, innocent families were rounded up and mothers, fathers, children, close relatives were um, targeted as well. Right. So yeah, in uh, 2004, you made a documentary, Prison Nation, Albania, 1943-1990, and we will, we'll, we'll, we will put a, a link in the chat. And then four years later, you founded this Albanian uh, Human Rights Project. What motivated you to uh, start this initiative and what did you hope to achieve with it? Um, the Prison Rights Project, okay. Right. Uh, well, uh, I, the, the prison nation film mm -hmm. was put together by a, a group of like-minded people I, I financed by them and they my sister who was a human rights activist and former professor of of uh, of uh, child development in boston university encouraged me encouraged uh, us to to show the, the film to Steven Spielberg of the, uh, <clears throat> the executive director of the Shoah Foundation. Well, mm -hmm. when he saw the film, he, <clears throat> he encouraged uh, us to keep going. Don't stop. Right. Uh, uh, film as many testimonies as you can, as did the Shoah Foundation with 52,000 uh, victims of the Holocaust, which was right financed by Steven Spielberg. Well, we weren't Steven Spielberg. And uh, funding was something that I had no idea about how, how to, I was, I was a writer, I, I wasn't a marketer. I had no fundraising uh, experience. Uh, uh, to raise funds legally, one would have to be, a, uh, would have to be incorporated and uh, become a nonprofit organization. So actually I had no idea what I was getting into, but to my surprise, things fell in place very easily. A friend of ours, um, a friend from church who had been a corporate attorney for the church uh, volunteered to incorporate us as an organization and uh, uh, set us up as a nonprofit, a volunteer nonprofit organization all he wa he would do it gratis, and all we had to do was to pay for the filing costs and documents. The, so, with together with a group of like-minded uh, friends, uh, human rights, most of them people who who valued freedom and uh, were human rights activists, founded the Albanian Human Rights Project, which uh, was. Um, was uh, designed to gather fil uh, film testimonies of former political prisoners under the communist regime for scholarly study, education, inspiration, forever. Right. So uh, right. with, a, uh, with a wonderful team of uh, board directors, uh, they were extraordinary, illustrious people, uh, people who, uh, who uh, were uh, willing to work uh, voluntarily for our cause and honorary board. We selected an honorary board of people who would lend their names. Among them was uh, the first ambassador to Albania in mm -hmm. 1992. Uh, the film team in Albania, we had set up a film team in Albania, which consisted of, of my brother-in-law, uh, a, a cousin who had been a, a very famous anchor man on TV who had lost, and a v devout communist 
who lost his job when when Albania was liberated and was willing to uh, act as our on and off camera interviewer. Uh, we were allowed uh, we were allowed to use the show of foundation guidelines for filming and for, for a question uh, and were given a template for the questionnaires that we would use as a pre-interview pre um, uh, format so that we could find the questions to ask uh, during the um, interview. Uh, we are very indebted to the Shoah Foundation for allowing us to use those guidelines, uh, which are very consistent with the ones used by the Shoah Foundation. So our, our, uh, our goal uh, was to, uh, of course, finish 100 testimonies. Right. And, right. Uh, and actually this project took a village. I mean, there were so many parts to it. Uh, uh, the, the Lincoln Center in, in uh, Albania was the former residence of Ender Hoxha. And it was now a school for business and language uh, development. And they allowed us to use the office that Enver Hoxha once used, which we thought very ironic that here we were, <laughs> a, a human rights organization in, in right. Enver Hoxha's uh, office. Poetic uh, justice. <laughs> we, uh, uh, so, I mean, there were donors among our own group of uh, directors. Uh, uh, Donika Barda was an Albanian, uh, Albanian American philanthropist. Uh, the, uh, we were allowed by clerics uh, uh, to uh, use, their, use their facilities for screenings and fundraising. Among them was Father Lyland of the Albanian Orthodox uh, Diocese. My sister uh, and her husband uh, hosted numerous screenings in Boston. Um, their church allowed us to use their facilities. Uh, eventually, the t uh, t uh, mayor of Tirana uh, 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 invited us to hold screenings and awarded us the keys to the city, wow. <laughs> which was That's quite great. an honor. Numerous right. volunteers help. I mean, the, the, the list is endless and we have so many people to thank and particularly uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, a, a suggestion that we, that we team up with, with the Wendy Museum mm -hmm. as partners. And uh, in 19, uh, 2012, we uh, entered a licensing agreement with the Wendy Museum in which they preserved the testimonies and would find scholars uh, uh, to study the material and uh, perform pro uh, educational programs. I mean- Which we are very been, proud to be part the, of this project. It, it was a blessing and uh, I don't know, a miracle for us, truly. It was, it, it couldn't have been a better, a better solution for us. That's wonderful. Uh, Rose, it's um, uh, half past 12, so we should go to the Q&A. And please um, uh, put your questions under the Q&A box where I will find them and read them. But in, um, um, while we are waiting for the first question, let, let me ask you one more uh, thing. You have been uh, guest teaching at uh, Tirana University, the University of Albania. Um, um, uh, in journalism, and um, what is your ex uh, impression? How did the Albanian students respond to your stories? And what did, did they actually know about their own recent national history? Oh, yes, it was a shock to me. Um, I, um, I, I first, when I first screened Prison Nation and the second document, short documentary we did, which, which was called Lost Voices Making History, uh, at the end of at the end of <laughs> of the documentary, there was a deafening silence. Maybe one minute, two minutes. I I couldn't mm -hmm. believe my ears. I but I realized that the students were absolutely stunned. They were stunned, and uh, only to discover that they had no idea such such 
a history occurred in Albania during the Cold War. They, right. they, they apparently were never, it was never spoken about in the homes. One or two said that they had relatives who had been imprisoned, but it was never talked about. And as a matter of fact, the prisoners we interviewed were very hesitant about talking about their experiences. In one case, uh, we sat with, a, uh, interviewed a, a, a former prisoner who, uh, with his son present, an 18 year old son was present. He had never heard this story before and he sat there weeping when he heard what his father had gone through. Oh. Uh, and this was consistent throughout my stay in Albania. Yeah, so you're really able to help open up this yes, more or less hidden, yeah, awareness. Yes, uh, the least we story. have done is to make try to make people aware, and the more, uh, <laughs> the more uh, scholars who study this, or the better. Of course, we are waiting <laughs> with bated breath to to find scholars to to study the material. However, uh, we have all the all the films transcribed uh, but uh, uh, about half of them remain of the 100 half of them remain uh, to be trans uh, translated into English and I you know scholars would be better off I think uh, with an English translation if they're not Albanian <laughs> for sure <laughs> absolutely okay thank you uh, I have a question here from yes. Kelly Hicknett and she asks were any of the former prison, prisoners reluctant to be interviewed and tell you their stories or were they keen to talk about their experiences? No, it took a long time for them to agree to in many cases and it was only because my brother-in-law who had been in prison camps throughout Albania uh, for, for 43 years uh, knew many of them and encouraged them to to take on this uh, interview. I, they were very yeah. reluctant to speak. I understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I see a question in the chat here from Lisa Stapleton. Has the commission formed by Prime Minister Edi Rama tasked with opening the Zigurimi secret police files made any progress? And have you worked with that project at all? Yes, uh, we have. We uh, were. Uh, we have our entire collection of interview, filmed interviews at the National Archive in Albania, ready to be used by anyone who wants to study them, uh, uh, with permission, of course, from the Wendy Museum, who now owns the material. We're very happy that the. Wendy Museum is the owner of this and curator of this material, and they are shepherding this project through. And uh, so, yes, we. You work with them. We yeah. work with them. Okay. Thank you. Next question is from Alexis Zoto. Thank you oh, so let much me, for. Let, let me just add one thing. Uh, people are. Uh, um, in Albania, there are many groups that are active, active in in uh, in acknowledging and and uh, bringing to light this this story. And the organizations have been going on for a long time, but uh, this COVID situation has put a cramp on activity lately. But they are still interested. Right. Right. So coming back to the question by Alexis Zoto, she writes, okay. no, no, that's okay. Thank you so much for all your work, Rose. Many of the younger generation in Albania do not know or believe the stories of these atrocities. Uh, true, true. And as you know, the legacy of the prisoners and their keepers or torturers have had ripple effects in the diaspora communities. It so could you comment or do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Uh, well, it has. The legacy of this uh, period has uh, filtered into the current uh, society more so in the beginning than, than now. Uh, one of uh, my friends who, is, uh, who was born and raised in Albania and came to the United States say that his mother still tells him to not say a word because the walls have ears. And I noticed among our, my students uh, when I was teaching 
journalism at the university that there was a sort of uh, uh, harshness in their criticism of one another. And I uh, struggled mm -hmm. to encourage them to be objective and to give constructive criticism. And when, when one student finally stood up and said that he admired the work of, of his colleague, I, I applauded him. <laughs> That's a nice story. Right. Um, I have a comment here from Sasha Razor. Rose, thank you for your work. We are going through a similar mass uh, incarceration experience in Belarus at the moment. And listening oh, to you good. right now gives us a valuable perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah. A question from Robert Hager. Is there any effort to honor the anti-communist resistance fighters who fought against the Hoxha uh, regime in the late 1940s? Well, there are organizations, there are prisoner, uh, prisoner rights organizations that, are, uh, that exist. And, um, and there, is, there are initiatives to help the former prisoners. Uh, they've been given housing and in some cases uh, stipends, monthly stipends. Uh, unfortunately, they have been marginalized. The former prisoners have been marginalized, just as any group would be. Uh, who uh, were in disfavor for a very, very long time. But uh, I think that is, imp that, um, is improved, that showing improvement too, I mean, uh, much less. Well, the children are becoming educated and their lives are significantly better than their parents. Right, right, right. Next question is from Marty Zisner. Uh, are former Nazi prison facility facilities still in use or were they still in use during the communist era and are they still in use uh, currently? The Nazi... Um, Nazi prisons. Yeah. Prisons. Oh, I, I honestly don't know very much about that. Okay. And uh, I can't comment on that, but maybe you, you can, maybe you know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Right, so somebody then, uh, out there knows. I, uh, as far as prisons go, I, I, I uh, we dealt strictly with the Albanian uh, jails and prisons. Uh, uh, sure. And studied those. Then we have a question from Donna Stein: Is there an active art community in Albania that addresses this subject? Well, you know that uh, Max Velo was one of them. And For I'm sure. sure, and I'm sure there are, but I, uh, in my uh, travels to Albania uh, during the filming periods, every six months, we would, uh, we would go to Albania to do the filming and spend the other six months trying, uh, raising funds to do so. Uh, right. But uh, I haven't, uh, yes, there are people who I'm sure there is a, a group of artists who are addressing this issue. I'm sure of it, and I think uh, I, uh, I don't know them, them by name, but right. you know I could investigate and and uh, give you a report. <laughs> yeah, maybe a possible future exhibition. That would be an interesting museum. idea. Yes. yes. Sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, Rose, um, you have. Um, uh, of course, very focusedly listen to those 100 uh, interviews. What would you say were the most striking um, or maybe the most shocking revelations you encountered? Yeah, the most shocking revelation was, of course, the hearing the horror stories of torture and I mean, torture, 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 and the euphemism for, for interrogation. Mm. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Interrogation was a euphemism for, for torture. Most I of see. them were beaten. Of course, they had, uh, they had, uh, uh, they talked, but, uh, but mostly the, prison, the former prisoners we talked with uh, reported that they were beaten, beaten right. and had their teeth yanked, their nails yanked, and horrible, horrible, horrible things happening mm. to them. But right. the most shocking thing that that, that I came uh, that absolutely floored me was to find that these people were not bitter. 
they forgave their tormentors. And I say, how can that be? Uh, mm -hmm. I asked an anthropologist who was doing some work with women trafficking up north, how is it possible for, for prisoners who had been tortured, uh, beaten, uh, to forgive their tormentors? And she said, one of two things happens. Either they perish because of mental or physical conditions, or they transcend, they become human beyond being human, spiritually enlightened. And uh, uh, these people, and I have to say that of the 100 people we interviewed, 95%, I would say, forgave their tormentors. That's amazing, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's what shocked me. I see, yeah. There's one uh, more question from Donna Stein. She writes, were prisoners in camps for 47 years able to have any sense of a normal life? Were a lot of yes. children born in the camps and were they schooled? Yes, uh, many children were born in the camps. In fact, we found all of the Dusty family with children. Uh, they were schooled up to, uh, I think, the eighth grade and nothing more. One, uh, one, one uh, former prisoner said that he wanted to go to school to a high school, to a lycée, but the uh, secret police uh, agent told him, "You, your father was a was uh, uh, an enemy of the people. You cannot go to school." So mm -hmm. schooling was really forbidden, uh, and unfortunately, they suffered for it. Right. I want to conclude, Rose, with one last uh, question. We spoke a little about um, the response of Albanian students when you were teaching yeah. at the university there. But what is the attitude of the current government in Albania towards its own history? Are they trying to open up things or are they trying to keep it uh, uh, more yeah. secret? Um, yeah, well, Albanians are dealing with the, the problem of their past the way anyone would, uh, bit by bit, um, just as we in America are doing with the issues of slavery and marginalization of the American Indian. But uh, today there are many human rights organizations in Albania involved in raising awareness uh, of this uh, issue. Although COVID-19, as, COVID as I said, is is uh, slowing the progress but in any case uh, uh, and of course they're still being marginalized but not as much as uh, initially i have hope that albania and the albanian people will prevail i mean they have over history they've survived oppression since uh since uh, 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 the Illyrian times with, with the Greeks in 5 AD, with the Romans in 2 AD, with, with uh, numerous, numerous uh, uh, invasions by, by the Byzantines, the Huns, the Bulgars, the Normans, the Serbs, the uh, Ottomans for 500 years. Uh, Austrian occupation in 1914, the monarchy, the fascists in 1939, Nazi Germany and uh, Nazis, uh, Nazis, the, and finally 50 years of uh, of dictatorship under a brutal dictator uh, from uh, from 44 to 80, 80 uh, 91. Yet, uh, yet, you know, Albania uh, managed to become a parliamentary constitutional republic, and it still is. Right. And Albanians, I think, are very resilient. They're courageous and they are survivors. After all, their language has lasted since the 1500 BC. <laughs> uh, right. It's a still, still the same language and they will continue to prevail, I think. So I think there's hope. Well, that's a beautiful way to end this interview. Rose, I want to thank you very, very much, uh, not only for this special interview, but also for the amazing work you are doing. Well, thank you for the, for the amazing work the Wendy Museum is doing in preserving and and uh, uh, curating this project and carrying it on. Of course. Thank Our you so much. Honor. Thank you.
So uh, our next uh, Cold War Spaces interview is in two weeks on Wednesday, August 11th with Stuart Schrader, who wrote a book, Badges Without Borders, which is about uh, US counterinsurgency initiatives and about policing at home and abroad. And uh, I also want to um, uh, alert you to uh, a special program this coming Friday. We will be visited at the Winter Museum by a Belarusian opposition leader, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya. And uh, she will be interviewed by uh, Sasha Razor, who I saw is uh, uh, joining us today at this interview as well. Um, uh, it's Friday, 7 p.m. Uh, so please check out the when the museum website if you're interested in this unique uh, interview okay thank you very much for watching and i hope to see you all in two weeks from now <laughs>